Chapter 5a Beta of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. Chapter 5a Beta The Observation of Self Consciousness in its Pure Form and in its Relation to External Reality. Logical and Psychological Laws. Translator's Note Observation can be directed upon the self-conscious process of mind in two ways. It may consider the mind's thinking relation to reality, and it may consider the mind's active or biotic relation to reality. The result of observation here, as in the foregoing case, finds expression in a number of laws which it frames. The laws in the first case are laws of thought or connected logical laws. In the latter case we have laws of psychic events, psychological laws. The analysis in this section shows the inadequacy of observation as such to deal with its material in both cases. It fails in the first case because 1. Laws of thought have no meaning apart from the reality with which thought is necessarily concerned. Laws of thought are laws of thinking, and thinking is both form and content. 2. Observation gives each law an absolute being of its own as if it were detached from the unity of self-consciousness, whereas this unity is the fundamental principle of each and all the laws which only exist in and by the single process of that unity. Hence a type of logic confined to observing laws of thought is necessarily untrue. Observation again fails in the second case because it is impossible to separate mind from its total environment. Observational or empirical psychology, therefore, is incapable of giving an adequate account of mind, and the constitution of the environment enters into, and in part determines, the constitution of the psychic events, and the latter cannot be explained even as events without interpreting the former at the same time. End of translator's note. Observation of nature finds the notion realised in inorganic nature. Laws whose moments are things which at the same time are in the position of abstractions. But this notion is not a unity reflected into itself. The life of organic nature, on the other hand, is just this condition of self-reflected simplicity. The opposition within itself, in the sense of the opposition of universal and individual, does not make its appearance in the essential nature of life itself, with one factor apart from the other. The essential reality is not the genus self-sundered and self-moved in its undifferentiated element, and remaining at the same time for itself undifferentiated in its opposition. Observation finds this free notion whose universality has just as absolutely within it developed individuality only in the notion which itself exists as a notion, i.e. in self-consciousness. Since observation now turns in upon itself and directs itself on the concrete notion as a free notion, it finds to begin with the laws of thought. This kind of individuality which thought in itself is the abstract moment of the negative, a moment returned entirely to the condition of abstract simplicity, and the laws are outside reality. To say they have no reality means ordinarily nothing else than that they are without any truth. They are intended to be, too, not indeed entire truth, but still formal truth. But what is purely formal without reality is an ens intellectus, or an empty abstraction, without the internal distinction which would be nothing else but the content. On the other hand, however, since they are laws of pure thought, while the latter is the inherently universal, and thus a kind of knowledge, which immediately contains being and therein all reality, these laws are absolute notions, and are at one and the same time the essential principles of form as well as of things. Since self-directing, self-moving universality is the simple notion in a state of diremption, this notion has, in the manner, a content in itself, and one in which is all content, though not sensuous, not a being of sense. It is a content which is neither in contradiction with the form, nor altogether separated from it. Rather, it is essentially the form itself, for the latter is nothing but the universal dividing itself into pure moments. In the way in which this form or content, however, comes before observation, qua observation, it gets the character of a content that is found, given, i.e., one which merely is. It becomes a passively existing centre of relations, a multitude of detached necessities, which, as a definitely fixed content, are to have truth just as they stand with their specific characteristic, and thus, in point of fact, are withdrawn from the form. 
this absolute truth of fixed characteristics or of a plurality of different laws contradicts however the unity of self-consciousness contradicts the unity of thought and form in general what is declared to be a fixed and inherently constant law can be merely a moment of the self-referring self-reflecting unity can come on the scene merely as a vanishing element when rescued however by the process of considering them from the movement imposing this continuous connection and when restated individually and separately it is not the content that they lack for they have specific content they lack rather the form which is their essential nature in point of fact it is not for the reason that they have to be merely formal and are not any content that these laws are not the truth of thought it is rather for the opposite reason it is because in their specific condition simply as a content with the form removed they want to pass for something absolute in their true nature as vanishing moments in the unity of thought they would have to be taken as knowledge or as thinking processes but not as laws of knowledge observing however neither is nor knows that knowledge itself observation transforms its nature into the shape of an objective being i e apprehends its negative character merely as laws of knowledge it is sufficient for our purpose here to have demonstrated the invalidity of the so-called laws of thought from the general nature of the case it falls to speculative philosophy to go more intimately and fully into the matter and there they show themselves to be what in truth they are single vanishing moments whose truth is simply the whole of the thinking process the process of knowledge itself this negative unity of thought exists for its own sake or rather it is just that condition of being for itself and on its own account the principle of individuality and in its reality it is acting function of consciousness consequently the mental attitude of observation will be the by nature the cause to be led towards this as being the reality of those laws of thought since this connection is not a fact for observation the latter supposes that thought with its laws remains standing separately on one side and that on the other side it obtains another objective being in what is now the object observed viz that acting consciousness which exists for itself in such a way as to cancel otherness and to find its reality in this direct awareness of itself as the negative in the active practical reality of consciousness observation thus finds opened up before it a new field psychology contains the collection of laws in virtue of which the mind takes up different attitudes towards the different forms of its reality given and presented to it in a condition of otherness the mind adopts these various attitudes partly with a view to receiving these modes of its reality into itself and conforming to these habits customs and ways of thinking it thus comes across as being that wherein mind is reality and as such object to itself partly with a view to knowing its own spontaneity activity in opposition to them to follow the bent of its own inclinations affections and emotions and to carry off thence what is merely the particular and a special moment for itself and thus make what is objective conform to itself in the former it behaves negatively towards itself as a single and individual mind in the latter it negatively towards itself as the universal being in the former aspect independence or self-dependence gives what is met with merely the form of consciousness individuality in general and as regards the content remains within the general reality given in the second aspect however it gives the reality at least a certain special modification which does not contradict its essential content or even a modification by which the individual qua particular reality and peculiar content sets itself against the general reality this opposition becomes a form of wrongdoing when the individual cancels that reality in a merely particular manner or when it does so in a manner that is general and thus for all when it puts another world another right law and custom in place of those already there the observational psychology which in the first instance states what observation finds regarding the general forms brought to its notice in the active functioning consciousness discovers all sorts of facilities inclinations and passions and since while narrating what this collection contains the remembrance of the unity of self-consciousness is not to be suppressed observational psychology is bound to get the length at least of wonderment that such a lot and such a miscellany of things can happen to be somehow alongside one another in the mind as a kind of bag more especially 
where they are seen to be not lifeless things but restless active processes in telling over these various facilities observation keeps to universal aspect the unity of these multifarious capacities is the opposite aspect to universality it is the actual concrete individuality to take up again the different concrete individualities and to describe how one man has more inclination for this the other for that and how one has more intelligence than the other all this is however something much more interesting than even to reckon up the species of insects mosses and so on for these latter give the observation the right to take them as thus individually and disconnectedly because they belong essentially to the sphere of fortuitous detailed particulars to take conscious individuality on the other hand as a particular phenomenal entity and to treat it in so wooden a fashion is self-contradictory because the essential nature of individuality lies in the universal element of mind since however the process of apprehending it causes at the same time to pass into the form of universality to apprehend it is to find its law and seems in this way to have a rational purpose in view and a necessary function to fulfil the moments constituting the content of the law are on the one an individuality itself on the other its universal inorganic nature viz the given circumstances situation habits customs religion and so forth from these the determinate individuality is to be understood and comprehended they contain something specific determinate as well as universal and are at the same time something lying at hand which furnishes material for observation and on the other side expresses itself in the form of individuality the law of this relation of the two sides has now to contain and express the sort of effect and influence these determinate circumstances exert on individuality this individuality however just consists both in being the universal and hence in passively and directly assimilating and blending with the given universals the customs habits etc thus becoming conformed to them as also in taking up an aptitude of opposition towards them and thus transforming and transmuting them and again in behaving towards them in its individual character with complete indifference neither allowing them to exert an influence over it nor setting itself actively against them on that account what is to have an influence on individuality the sort of influence it is to have which properly speaking means the same thing depends entirely on individuality itself consequently to say that this individuality has become this specifically determinate individuality means nothing else than saying that it has been this all along circumstances situations customs and so on which show themselves on one side as something given and on the other as within this specific individuality reveal merely their own indeterminate nature which is not the point under consideration if these circumstances style of thought customs the whole state of the world in short had not been then assuredly the individual would not be what he is for all the individuals that find a place in this state of the world go to constitute this universal substance for what it is the way in which the condition of the world becomes particularized in any given individual however and such an individual has to be understood and comprehended could have been no other than the way in which it particularizes itself in a determinate universal and this determinate form alone could have operated on the individual as it does only so could it have made the individual the specific particular individual he is if the external element is so constituted in and for itself as it appears in individuality the latter would be comprehended from the nature of the former we should have a double gallery of pictures one which should be the reflection of the other the one the gallery of external circumstances completely encompassing circumscribing determining the individual the other the same gallery translated into the form in which those circumstances are the conscious individual the former the spherical influence the latter the center reflectively representing that surface within it but the spherical surface the world for the individual carries on it the face of this double meaning it is in and for itself the actual world and situation and is the world of the individual it is the world of the individual either in so far as this individual could merely be fused and blended with it and had let that world just as it is pass into its own nature and had taken up towards it merely the attitude of a formal consciousness or on the other hand it is the world of the individual in the sense in which the given has been transformed and transmuted by that individual
since reality is capable of having this twofold meaning on account of this freedom of the individual the world of the individual is only to be understood from the individual himself and the influence of reality upon the individual a reality which is represented as having a being all its own and und für sich receives through the individual absolutely the opposite significance the individual either lets the stream of reality flowing in upon it have its way or breaks off and diverts the current of the influence in consequence of this however psychological necessity becomes an empty phrase so empty that there is the absolute possibility that what should have had this influence could equally well have not had it herewith drops out of account that existence which was to be something all by itself and was meant to constitute one aspect and that the universal aspect of a law individuality is what its world in the sense of its own world is individuality itself is the cycle of its own action in which it has presented and established itself as reality and is simply and solely a unity of which was given and of what is constructed a unity whose aspects do not fall apart as in the idea of psychological law into a world given per se and an individuality existing for itself or if those aspects are thus considered each by itself there is no necessity to be found between them and no law of their relation to one another end of chapter five a section beta recording by morris in alzey bedfordshire Section 17 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. Chapter 5a, Section C observation of the relation of self-consciousness to its immediate actuality physiognomy and phrenology translator's note in the previous section observation was directed upon the relation of mind to external reality the natural environment of individuality the relation of mind to its own physical embodiment furnishes a further object for observation to take up how observation operates in dealing with this relation forms the subject of the analysis in the present section up to and at the time at which hegel wrote the discussion of this relation took the form of what are now looked upon as either as spurious sciences or at best as falling within the scope of physiology or psychophysics those pseudo-sciences were physiognomy and phrenology or cranioscopy both had in one form or another engaged the attention of reflective minds from the earliest times but about the latter half of the eighteenth century they gained unusual public prominence in germany france and england through the eloquence and conviction of their exponents so much so that in germany a law was passed forbidding the promulgation of phrenology as being dangerous to religion and in england a law of george the second re-enacted the statute of elizabeth imposing the severest penalties on physiognomists the chief exponents and propagandists of these studies of the human individual were lavater 1741 to 1801 in physiognomy and gall 1758 to 1828 along with his pupil Spurzheim, in phrenology. The personal character and influence at first, combined with his rhetorical eloquence, compelled the attention not only of the popular mind, but of men of outstanding intelligence, while Gall lectured publicly and went from one university to another, expounding the generalizations discovered or made. It was impossible, therefore, for any philosopher who attempted to discuss comprehensively the methods and procedure of observational science to ignore the claims made by these pseudo-sciences or to refuse to examine the validity of the laws they proposed to formulate this was all the more necessary because the object they dealt with the relation of mind to its physical embodiment was and is unquestionably an important fact of experience and presents a serious problem to philosophy especially to idealism hence we have in the following section an elaborate analysis of the observational sciences of physiognomy and phrenology an analysis the length of which can only be explained and justified by the historical circumstances above indicated the ruthless criticism the bitterness of the attack upon and the contempt for the claims of these sciences displayed throughout hegel's analysis are only explicable in view of the scientific and philosophical pretensions of the expanders of these sciences observation of the relation of self-consciousness to its immediate actuality physiognomy and phrenology 
psychological observation discovers no law for the relation of self-consciousness to actuality or the world over against it and owing to their mutual indifference and independence it is forced to fall back on the peculiar determinate characteristic of real individuality which has a being in and for itself or contains the opposition of subjective self-existence and objective inherent existence sein, dissolved and extinguished within its own process of absolute mediation individuality alone is now the object for observation or the object to which observation now passes the individual exists in himself and for himself he is for himself or is a free activity he is however also in himself or has himself an original determinate being of his own a characteristic which is in principle the same as what psychology sought to find outside him opposition thus breaks out in his own self it has this twofold nature it is a process or movement of consciousness and it is the fixed being of a reality with a phenomenal character a reality which in it is directly its own this being the body of the determinate individuality is its ultimate and original source or condition that in the making of which it has nothing to do but since the individual at the same time merely is what he has done his body is also an expression of himself which he has brought about a sign and indication as well which has not remained a bare immediate fact but only points to and lets us see what is meant by his setting his original nature to work if we consider the moments we have here in relation to the view previously indicated we find a general human shape and form or at least general character of a climate of a portion of the world of a people just as formerly we found in the same way general customs and culture in addition too the particular circumstances and situation come within the universal reality here this particular reality is a particular formation of the shape and mould of the individual on the other side just as the free activity of the individual and reality in the sense of his own reality were formerly placed in contrast and opposition to reality as given here the shape assumed by the individual stands as an expression of his own actualization established by the individual himself it bears the lineaments and forms of his spontaneously active being but the universal as well as particular reality which observation formerly met with outside the individual is here the reality of the individual his conate body and within this very body the expression due to his own action appears from the psychological point of view objective reality in and for itself and determinate individuality had to be brought into relation to one another here however it is the whole determinate individuality that is the object for observation and each aspect of the opposition it entails is itself this whole thus to the outer whole belongs not merely the original primordial being the conate body but the formation of the body as well which is due to activity from the inner side the body is a unity of unformed and formed existence and is the reality of the individual pervaded and permeated by his reference to self this whole embraces the definite and specific parts fixed originally and from the first and also the lines or lineaments which only arise as the result of action this whole so formed is and this being is an expression of what is inner and within of the individual constituted as a consciousness and as a process this inner is too no longer formal spontaneous activity without any content or determinateness of its own an activity with its content and specific nature as in the former case lying in external circumstances it is an original inherently determinate character whose form is just the activity what then we have to consider here is the relation subsisting between the two sides the point to observe is how this relation is determined and what is to be understood by the inner finding expression in the outer this outer in the first place does not act as an organ making the inner visible or in general terms a being for another for the inner so far as it is in the organ is the activity itself the mouth that speaks the hand that works with the bones too if we care to add them are the operative organs affecting the actual realization and they contain the action qua action or the inner as such the externality however which the inner obtains by their means is the deed the act in the sense of a reality separated and cut off from the individual language and labor are outer expressions in which the individual no longer retains possession of himself per se but lets the inner get right outside him and puts it in the hands of another for that reason we might just as truly say that these outer expressions express the inner too much as that they do so too little too much because the inner itself breaks out in them 
and there remains no opposition between them and it they not merely give an expression of the inner they give the inner itself directly and immediately too little because in speech and action the inner turns itself into something else into another and thereby puts itself at the mercy of change and alteration which transmute and distort the spoken word and the accomplished act and make something else out of them than they are in and for themselves as actions of a particular determinate individual not only do the products of actions owing to this externality lose by the influence of others the character of being something constant as regards other individualities but by their assuming towards the inner which they contain the attitude of something external separate independent and indifferent they can through the individual himself be qua inner something other than they seem either the individual intentionally makes them to all appearance something else than they are in truth or he is too incompetent to give himself the outer aspect he really wanted and to give them such fixity and permanence that the product of his action cannot become transformed and distorted by others the action then in the form of a completed product has the double and opposite significance of being either the inner individuality and not its expression or qua external a reality detached from the inner a reality which is something quite different from the former on account of this twofold meaning we must look about for the inner as it still is within the individual himself but in a visible or external form in the organ however it exists merely as immediate activity as such which attains its externalization in the act or deed that either does or again does not represent the inner the organ in the light of this opposition thus does not afford the expression which is sought if now the external shape and form were able to express the inner individuality only in so far as that shape is neither an organ nor action hence only in so far as it is an inert passive whole it would then play the role of a persisting or subsistent thing which receives undisturbed the inner as an alien element into its own passive being and thereby became the sign and symbol of it an external contingent expression whose actual concrete aspect has no meaning of its own a language whose accent and combinations are not the real fact itself but are arbitrarily and capriciously connected with it and a mere accident so far as it is concerned such a capricious association of factors that are external for one another does not give a law physiognomy however would claim distinction from other spurious arts and unwholesome studies on the ground that in dealing with determinate individuality it considers the necessary opposition of an inner and an outer of character as a conscious nature and character as a definitely embodied organic shape and relates these moments to one another in the way they are related to one another by their very conception and hence must constitute the content of a law in astrology on the other hand in palmistry and such like kinds of knowledge there appears merely external element related to external element anything whatsoever to an element alien to it a given constellation at birth and when the external element is brought closer to the body itself certain given lines on the hand are external factors making for long or short life and the fate in general of the particular person being externalities they are indifferent towards one another and have none of the necessity for one another which ought to lie in the relation of what is outer to what is inner the hand to be sure does not seem to be such a very external thing for fate it seems rather to stand to it as something inner for fate again is also merely the phenomenal manifestation of what the specifically determinate individuality inherently is as having an inner determinate constitution originally and from the start now to find out what this individuality is in itself the palmist as well as the physiognomist takes a shorter cut than for example solon who thought he could only know this from and after the course of the whole life the latter looked at the phenomenal explicit reality while the former considers the implicit nature thus an sich that the hand however must exhibit and reveal the inherent nature of individuality as regards its fate is easily seen from the fact that after the organ of speech it is the hand most of all by which a man actualizes and manifests himself it is the lively artificer of his fortune we may say of the hand it is what a man does for in it as the effective organ of his self-fulfillment he is there present as the animating soul and since he is ultimately and originally his own fate the hand will thus express his innate inherent nature from this peculiarity that the organ of activity is at once a form of being and the operation effected within it or again that the inner inherent being 
is itself explicitly present in it and has a being for others we come upon a further aspect of it different from the preceding for if the organs in general prove to be incapable of being taken as expressions of the inner for the reason that in them the operation is present as a process while the operation as a deed or act is merely external and inner and outer in this way fall apart and are or can be alien to one another the organ must in view of the peculiarity now considered be again taken as also a middle term for both since this very fact that the operation takes place and is present in it constitutes eo ipso an external attribute of it and indeed one that is different from the deed or act for the former holds by the individual and remains with him this mediating term uniting inner and outer is in the first place itself external too but then this externality is at the same time taken up into the inner it stands in the form of simple unbroken externality opposed to dispersed and disintegrated externality which either is a single performance or condition contingent for the individuality as a whole or else in the form of a total externality is fate or destiny split up into a plurality of performances and conditions the mere lines of the hand then the ring and compass of the voice as also the individual peculiarity of the language used or again this idiosyncrasy of language as expressed where the hand gives it more durable existence than the voice can do that is in writing especially in the particular style of handwriting all this is an expression of the inner so that as against the multifarious externality of action and fate this expression again stands in the position of simple mere externality placed the part of an inner in relation to the externality of action and fate thus then if at first the specific nature and innate peculiarity of the individual along with what these become as the result of cultivation and development are regarded as the inner reality as the essence of action and of fate this inner being gets its appearance in external fashion to begin with from the mouth hand voice handwriting and the other organs and their permanent characteristics thereafter and not till then does it give itself further outward expression when realized in the world now because this middle term assumes the nature of an outer expression which is at the same time taken back into the inner its existence is not confined to the immediate organ carrying out the action this middle term is rather the movement and form of countenance and figure in general which perform no outward act these lineaments and their movements on this principle are the checked and restrained action that stops at the individual and as regards his relation to what he actually does constitute his own personal inspection and observation of the action expression in the sense of reflection upon the actual expression the individual is therefore not a mute and silent spectator on the occasion of his external action since he is there reflected into himself at the same time and gives articulate expression to his self-reflection this theoretical activity the individual's conversing with himself on the matter is also perceptible to others for his speaking is itself an outer expression in this inner then which in being expressed remains an inner observation finds the individual reflected out of his actual reality and we have to see how the case stands with this necessity involved in the unity here his being thus reflected is to begin with different from the act itself and therefore can be and be taken for something other than the deed is we look at a man's face and see whether he is in earnest with what he says or does conversely however what is here intended to be an expression of the inner is at the same time an existent objective expression and hence itself falls to the level of mere existence which is absolutely contingent for the self-conscious individual it is therefore no doubt an expression but at the same time only in the sense of a sign or symbol so that to the content expressed the peculiar nature of that by which it is expressed is completely indifferent the inner in thus appearing is doubtless an invisible made visible but without being itself attached to this appearance it can just as well make use of some other appearance as another inner can adopt the same kind of appearance Lichtenberg, therefore is right in saying suppose the physiognomist ever did have a man in his grasp it would merely require a courageous resolution on the man's part to make himself again incomprehensible for centuries in the previous case that is the relation of self-consciousness to external reality the immediately given circumstances formed a sphere of existence from which individuality selected what it could or what it wanted either submitting to or transmuting this given existence for which reason this did not contain the necessity and inner nature of the individuality 
similarly here the immediate being in which individuality clothes its appearance is one which either expresses the fact of its being reflected back out of reality and existing within itself or which is for it merely a sign indifferent to what is signified and therefore signifying in reality nothing it is as much its countenance as its mask which can be put off when it likes individuality permeates its own shape moves speaks in the shape assumed but this entire mode of existence equally well passes over into a state of being indifferent to the will and the act individuality effaces from it the significance it formerly had of being that wherein individuality is reflected into itself or has its true nature and instead puts its real nature rather in the will and the deed individuality abandons that condition of being reflected into self which finds expression in lines and lineaments and places its real nature in the performance the work done herein it contradicts the relationship which the instinct of reason engaged in observing self-conscious individuality establishes in regard to what its inner and outer should be this point of view brings us to the special idea at the basis of the science of physiognomy if we care to call it so the opposition this form of observation comes upon is in form the opposition of practical and theoretical both falling inside the practical aspect itself the opposition of individuality making itself real in action in the most general sense of action and individuality is being in this action at the same time reflected thence into self and taking the action for its object observation apprehends and accepts this opposition in the same inverted form in which it is when it makes its appearance to observation the deed itself and the performance whether it be that of speech or a more solid reality stand for the contingent non-essential outer while the individuality's existence within itself passes for the essential inner of the two aspects which the practical mind involves intention and act the pondering over the action and the action itself observation selects the former as the true inner the latter is to have its more or less unessential externalization in the act its true outer expression however is to be had in the form in which the individual is embodied this latter expression is the sensuous immediate presence of the individual self-conscious agent the inwardness which is to be the true and internal aspect is the personal peculiarity of the intention and the individual singleness of his self-existence both together the mind is subjectively meant thus what observation takes for its object is an existence that is meant and there it looks for laws the primary way of thinking about and giving the meaning of the presumptive presence of mind is that of a natural physiognomy hasty judgment formed at a glance regarding the inner nature and the character of its form and shape the object of this kind of guesswork thinking is so constituted that its very nature involves its being in truth something other than merely sensuous and immediate certainly what is really present is just this condition of being in sensuous form reflected out of sense into self it is the visible as a sensuous presentment of the invisible which constitutes the object of observation but this very sensuous immediate presence is an actuality of mind only as it is for subjective conjecture meinung and observation from this point of view occupies itself with its presumed gemeind existence with physiognomy handwriting sound of voice etc this sort of existence refers to just such a supposed or presumed gemeintes inner it is not the murderer the thief that is to be known it is the capacity to be a murderer or thief the definitely marked abstract attribute is thereby lost in the particular individual's concrete infinite characteristic nature which now demands more skilful delineations than the former qualifications supply such skilful delineations no doubt say more than the qualification murderer thief or good-hearted unspoiled and so on but are a long way short of their aim which is to express the existence that is meant the single individuality as far short as the delineations of the form and shape which go further than a flat brow a long nose etc for the individual shape and form like the individual self-consciousness is qua presumed existence inexpressible the science of knowing men which takes to do with a supposititious human being like the science of physiognomy which deals with its presumptive reality and seeks to raise to the level of demonstrable knowledge those uncritical assertions of natural physiognomy is therefore something with neither foundation nor finality it cannot manage to say what it means because it merely means or presumes and its content is merely what is presumed or meant the so-called laws this kind of science sets out to find 
are relations holding between these two presumed or supposed aspects and hence can amount to no more than an empty fancying again too since this pretense at knowledge which takes upon itself to deal with the reality of the mind finds its object to be just the fact that mind is reflected from sense existence back into self and determinate existence is an indifferent accident for it it is bound to be aware at once that by the so-called laws discovered it really means nothing at all but that strictly speaking all this is mere chatter or merely a fancy or opinion of its own an expression which brings out the truth that to state one's opinion one's fancy and not to convey thereby the fact itself but merely a fancy of one's own are one and the same thing in content however such observations cannot differ from these it always rains at our annual fair says the theatre and every time too says the housewife when i am drying my washing lichtenberg who characterizes physiognomic observation in this way makes this remark if any one says you act certainly like an honest man but i can see from your figure you are forcing yourself to do so and are a rogue at heart without a doubt every brave fellow to the end of time when accosted in that fashion will retort with a box in the ear this retort is very striking for the reason that it refutes the fundamental assumption of such a guesswork method of conjecture meinen, that is that the reality of a man is his face etc the true being of a man is rather his act individuality is real in the deed and a deed it is which cancels both the aspect of what is meant or presumed to be in the one aspect where what is presumed or imagined takes the form of a passive bodily being individuality puts itself forward in action as the negative essence which only is so far as it cancels being then furthermore the act does away with the inexpressibleness of what self-conscious individuality really means in regard to such meaning this individuality is endlessly determined and determinable this false infinite this endless determining is abolished in the performance of the act the act is something simply determinate universal to be grasped as an abstract distinctive whole it is murder theft a benefit a deed of bravery and so on and what it is can be said of it it is such and such and its being is not merely a symbol it is the fact itself it is this and the individual human being is what the act is in the bare simplicity of this being the individual has for others a definite essential nature of a certain general kind and ceases to be merely something that is meant or presumed to be this or that no doubt he is not there put forward in the form of mind but when it is a question of his being qua being and the twofold being of bodily shape and act are pitted against one another each claiming to be his true reality the deed alone is to be affirmed as his genuine being not his figure or shape which would express what he means to convey by his act or what one might conjecture he merely could do in the same way again when his performance and his inner possibility capacity or intention are opposed the former alone is to be regarded as his true reality even if he finds things turn out different from what he expected and fancies when he turns from the act to what is in his mind that he is something else in his inner mind than what he is in the act individuality which commits itself to the objective element when it sets out to do something no doubt puts itself at the mercy of that element to be altered and perverted as the latter decides but what settles the character of the act is just this whether the deed is a real thing that holds together or whether it is merely a pretended or supposed performance which is in itself null and void and passes away objectification does not alter the act itself it merely shows what the deed is that is whether it is or whether it is nothing the breaking up of this being into intentions and subtleties of that sort by which the real man that is his deed is to be reduced again to and explained in terms of his conjectured being as even the individual himself may produce particular intentions to explain his own reality all this must be left to idle fancying and presuming to furnish at its leisure if this idle thinking will set its ineffective wisdom to work and will deny the agent the character of reason and use him so badly as to want to declare his figure and his lineaments to be his real being instead of his act then it may expect to get the retort above spoken of a retort which shows that figure is not the inherent being but is at any rate an object that can be pretty roughly handled end of section seventeen chapter five a subsection c part one Section 18 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by phone. The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. Chapter 5a, Subsection C, Physiognomy and Phrenology, Part 2. If we now look at the range of relations as a whole in which self-conscious individuality can be observed standing towards its outer aspect, there will be one left which has still to come before observation as an object. In psychology it is the external reality of things which in the life of mind is to have its counterpart conscious of itself and make the mind intelligible. In physiognomy, on the other hand, mind or spirit is to be known in its own proper outer, physical, aspect a form of being which may be called the language or utterance of mind, the visible invisibility of its inner nature. There is still left the further character of the aspect of reality, that individuality expresses its nature in its immediate actuality, an actuality that is definitely fixed and purely existent. This last relation, of mind to its reality, is distinguished from the physiognomic by the fact that this is the speaking presence of the individual, who in his practical active outer expression brings to light and manifests at the same time the expression wherein he reflects himself into himself and contemplates himself an expression which is itself a movement passive lineaments which are themselves essentially a mediated form of existence in the feature still to be considered however the outer phase is in the end an entirely inactive objectivity which is not in itself a speaking sign but presents itself on its own account, separate from the self-conscious process, and has the form of a bare thing. In the first place, in regard to the relation of the inner to this its outer, it is clear that that relation seems bound to be understood in the sense of a casual connection, since the relation of one immanent and inherent entity to another, qua a necessary relation, is causal connection. Now, for spiritual individuality to have an effect on the body, it must qua cause be itself corporeal the corporeal aspect however wherein it acts as a cause is the organ not the organ of action on external reality but of the action of the self-conscious being within itself operating outward only on its own body it is at the same time not easy to see what these organs can be if we merely think of organs in general the organ for work and toil would at once occur to us so too the organ of sex and so on but organs of that sort are to be considered as instruments or parts which mind qua one extreme possesses as a means for dealing with the other extreme which is an outer object in the present case however an organ is to be understood to be one wherein the self-conscious individual as an extreme maintains himself on his own account and for himself against his own proper actuality which is opposed to him the individual not being at the same time turned upon the outer world but reflected in his own action and where further his aspect of existence is not an existence objective for some other individual in the case of physiognomy too the organ is no doubt considered as an existence reflected into self and criticizing the action but in this case the existence is objective in character and the outcome of the physiognomical treatment is that self-consciousness treats its own reality as something to which it can be indifferent this indifference disappears in the fact that this very state of being reflected into self is directly active, thereby that existence occupies and maintains a necessary relation to it. But to operate effectually on that existence, it must itself have a being, though not properly speaking an objective being, and it must be shown to be an organ in this sense. In ordinary life, anger, for example as an internal action of that sort, is located in the liver, Plato even assigns the liver something still higher, something which to many is even the highest function of all, that is, prophesying, or the gift of uttering in an irrational manner things sacred and eternal. But the process which goes on in the individual's liver, heart, and so on, cannot be regarded as one wholly internal to the individual, wholly reflected into his self. Rather it is there in such a form that his body is from the first smitten with it, and the process assumes a physical existence, becomes an animal force, reacting on and directed toward external reality. The nervous system, on the other hand, is the immediate stability of the organism in its process of movement. The nerves themselves, no doubt, are again organs of that consciousness which from the first is immersed in its outward impulses. Brain and spinal cord, however, may be looked at as the immediate presence of self-consciousness, a presence self-contained, not an object and also not transient. 
in so far as the moment of being which this organ has is a being for another is an objective existence it is a being that is dead and is no longer the presence of self-consciousness the self-contained existence however is by its very nature a fluent stream wherein the circles that are made in it immediately break up and dissolve and where no distinction is expressed as permanent or real meanwhile as mind itself is not an abstractly simple entity but a system of processes wherein it distinguishes itself into moments but in the very act of distinguishing remains free and detached and as mind articulates its body as a whole into a variety of functions and designates one particular part of the body for only one function so too one can represent to oneself the fluent state of its internal existence its existence within itself as something that is articulated into parts moreover it seems bound to be thought of in this way because the self-reflected being of the mind in the brain itself is again merely a middle term between its pure essential nature and its bodily articulation an intermediate link which thereby forms the nature of both and thus from the side of the latter must also again have in it the actual articulation the psycho-organic being has at the same time the necessary aspect of a stable subsistent existence the former must retire qua extreme of self-existence and have this latter as the other extreme over against it an extreme which is then the object on which the former acts as a cause if now brain and spinal cord are that bodily self-existence of mind the skull and vertebral column form the other extreme separated off that is the solid fixed stable thing when however any one thinks of the proper place where mind exists it is not the back that occurs to him but merely the head since this is so we can in examining a form of knowledge like what we are at present dealing with content ourselves with this reason not a very bad one in the present case in order to confine the existence of mind to the skull should it strike any one to take the vertebral column for the seat of mind in so far as by it too knowledge and action doubtless are sometimes partly induced and partly educed this would prove nothing in defence of the view that the spinal cord must be taken as well for the indwelling seat of mind and the vertebral column for the existential counterpart because this proves too much for we may bear in mind that there are also other approved external ways for succoring this activity of mind in order to stimulate or inhibit its activity the vertebral column then drops rightly if we like out of account and our construing that the skull alone does not in fact contain the organs of mind is just as good as many other doctrines construed by philosophy of nature for this was previously excluded from the notion of this relation and on that account the skull was adopted as the aspect of existence or if we may not recall what the state of the case essentially and in principle involves even experience teaches us clearly that as we do not see with the eye qua organ so it is not with the skull that we commit murder steal read poetry etc we must on that account refrain too from using the expression organ when speaking of the significance of the skull which we have still to mention for although it is a common thing to hear people say that to reasonable men it is not words but facts that really matter yet that does not give us permission to describe a thing in terms not appropriate to it for this is at once stupidity and deceit pretending merely not to have the right word and hiding from itself that in reality it has not got hold of the fact itself the notion if the latter were there it would soon find the right word what has been here determined is in the first instance merely that just as the brain is the caput vivum the skull is the caput mortum it is in this ens mortum then that the mental processes and specific functions of the brain would have to find their external reality manifested and set forth a reality which is none the less in the individual himself for the relation of those processes and functions to what being an ens mortum does not contain mind indwelling within it there is offered in the first instance the external and mechanical factor the fixed solid element above mentioned so that the organs proper and these are in the brain here press the skull out round there make it broad or force it flat or in whatever way we care to state the effect thus exerted being itself a part of the organism it must be supposed to have in it too as is the case in every bone an active living formative influence so that from this point of view it really from its side presses the brain and fixes its external boundary which it is the better able to do being the harder 
in that shape however the relation of the activity of the one to the other would always maintain the same character for whether the skull is the determining factor or the factor determined this would effect no alteration in the general causal connection only that the skull would then be made the immediate organ of self-consciousness because its aspect of existence for self would find expression in its causal function but since self-existence in the sense of organic living activity belongs to both in the same manner the causal connection between them in point of fact drops altogether this development of the two however would be inwardly connected and would be an organic pre-established harmony which leaves the two interrelated aspects free as regards one another each with its own proper form and shape without the shape needing to correspond to that of the other and still more so as regards the relation of the shape and the quality just as the form of the grape and the taste of wine are mutually independent of one another since however the character of self-existence turns on the brain while that of existence turns on the feature of skull there is also a causal connection to be set up between them inside the organic unity a necessary relation between them as external for one another that is a relation itself external whereby their form and shape is determined the one through the other as regards the characteristic however in virtue of which the organ of self-consciousness would operate causally on the opposite aspect all sorts of statements can be made for the question concerns the peculiarity of a cause which is considered in regard to what for it is indifferent its formal shape and quantity a cause whose inner nature and self-existence are to be precisely what leave quite unaffected the immediately existing aspect the organic self-formation of the skull is to begin with indifferent to the mechanical influence exerted and the relationship in which these two processes stand since the former consists in relating itself to itself is just this very indeterminateness and boundlessness furthermore even though the brain accepted the distinctions of mind and took them into itself as existential distinctions and where a plurality of inner organs occupying each a different space it would be left undecided whether a mental element would according as it was originally stronger or weaker either be bound to possess in the first case a more expanded brain organ or in the latter case a more contracted brain organ or just the other way about but it is contradictory to nature for the brain to be such a plurality of internal organs for nature gives the moments of the notion an existence of their own and hence puts the fluent simplicity of organic life clear on one side and its articulation and division with its distinctions on the other so that in the way they have to be taken here they assume the form of particular anatomical facts the same holds good in regard to the question whether the improvement of the brain would enlarge or diminish the organ whether it would make it coarser and thicker or finer by the fact that it remains undetermined how the cause is constituted it is left in the same way undecided how the effect exerted on the skull comes about whether it is a widening or a narrowing and shrinking of it suppose this effect is named in perhaps more distinguished phrase a solicitation we cannot say whether this takes place by swelling like the action of a cantharidus plaster or by shriveling like the action of vinegar in defence of all views of that kind plausible reasons can be adduced for the organic relation which quite as much exerts its influence finds one fit as well as another and is indifferent to all this wit of mere understanding it is however not the interest of observation to seek to determine this relation for it is in any case not the brain in the sense of a physical part which takes its stand on one side but brain in the sense of the existential form of self-conscious individuality this individuality qua abiding character and self-moving conscious activity exists for itself and within itself opposed to this existence within itself and on its own account stand its reality and its existence for another its own peculiar existence is the essential nature and is subject having a being in the brain this being is subsumed under it and gets its value and worth merely through its inherent and indwelling significance the other aspect of self-conscious individuality however that of its existence is being qua independent and subject or qua a thing that is a bone the real existence of man is a skull bone this is the relationship and the sense which the two aspects of this relation have when the mind adopts the attitude of observation observation has now to deal with the more specific and determinate relation of these aspects the skull bone doubtless in general has the significance of being the immediate reality of mind but the many-sidedness of mind gives its existence a corresponding variety of meanings 
what we have to find out is the specific meaning of the particular regions into which this existence is divided and we have to see how the reference to mind is denoted in them the skull bone is not an organ of activity nor even a process of utterance we neither commit theft murder etc with the skull bone nor does it in the least contort the face to suit the deed in such cases so that the skull should express the meaning in the language of gesture nor does this existential form possess the value even of a sign and symbol look and gesture tone even a pillar or a post stuck up on a desert island proclaim at once that they stand for something else than what they merely are at first sight they forthwith profess to be signs since they have in them a characteristic which points to something else by the fact that it does not belong peculiarly to them doubtless too in the case of a skull there is many an idea that may occur to us like those of hamlet over yorick's skull but the skull-bone by itself is such an indifferent object such a harmless thing that there is nothing else to be seen in it or to be thought about it directly as it is except simply the fact of its being a skull it no doubt reminds us of the brain and its specific nature and skulls with other formations but it does not recall a conscious process since there is impressed on it neither a look or gesture nor anything which would show traces of derivation from a conscious activity for it is that form of reality which in the case of individuality is intended to set forth and make manifest another aspect of a kind that would no longer be an existence reflecting into itself but bare immediate existence while further the skull does not itself feel there seems still a possibility of providing it with a more determinate significance in the fact that specific feelings or sensations might enable us through their being contiguous or in proximity to it to find out what the skull may mean to convey and since a conscious mode of mind has its feelings in a specific region of the skull it may be thought perhaps that this localization on the shape of the skull may indicate what the mode is and what its peculiar nature just as for example many people complain of feeling a painful tension somewhere in the head when thinking intensely or even when thinking at all so it might be that stealing committing murder writing poetry and so on could each be accompanied with its own proper feeling which would over and above be bound to have its peculiar localization this locality of the brain which would in this manner be more disturbed and exercised would also most likely modify further the contiguous locality of the bone of the skull or again this latter locality would from sympathy or conformity not be inert but would enlarge or diminish or in some other way assume a corresponding form what however makes such a hypothesis improbable is this feeling in general is something indeterminate and that feeling in the head as the centre might well be the general feeling that accompanies all suffering so that mixed up with the thieves murderers poets tickling or pain in the head there would be other feelings too and they would permit of being distinguished from one another or from those we may call bodily feelings as little as an illness can be determined from the symptom of headache if we restrict its meaning merely to the bodily element in point of fact from whatever side we look at the matter all necessary reciprocal relation between them ceases to be of any account and so too any intimation the one might give of the other in virtue of such a relation if the relation is still to hold what is left to form a sort of necessary relation is a pre-established harmony of the corresponding features of the two sides a harmony which leaves the factors in question quite detached and rests on no inherent principle for one of the aspects has to be a non-mental reality a bare thing thus then on one side we have a number of passive regions of the skull and the other a number of mental properties the variety and character of which will depend on the condition of psychological investigation the poorer the idea we have of mind the easier the matter becomes in this respect for in part the fewer become the mental properties and in part the more detached fixed and ossified and consequently more akin to features of the bone and more comparable with them but while much is doubtless made easier by this miserable representation of the mind there still remains a very great deal to be found on both sides there remains for observation to deal with the entire contingency of their relation when every faculty of the soul every passion and for this too must be considered here the various shades of characters which hyper-subtle psychology and knowledge of mankind are accustomed to talk about are each and all assigned their place on the skull and their contour on the skull-bone 
the arbitrariness and artificiality of the procedure are just as glaring as if the children of israel who had been likened to the sand by the seashore for multitude had each assigned and taken to himself his own symbolic grain of sand the skull of a murderer has not this organ or sign but this bump but this murderer has in addition a lot of other properties and other bumps too and along with the bumps hollows as well bumps and hollows there is room for selection and again his murderous propensity can be referred to some bump or hollow or another and this in turn to some mental quality or another for the murderer is neither this abstract of a murderer nor does he have merely one protuberance and one depression the observations offered on this point must therefore sound just about as sensible as those of the dealer about the rain at the annual fair and of the housewife at her washing time dealer and housewife might as well make the observation that it always rains when some neighbour passes by or when they have roast pork from the point of view of observation a given determinate characteristic of mind is just as indifferent to and independent of a given specific formation of the skull as the rain in regards to circumstances like these for of the two objects thus under observation the one is an arid entity existing on its own account an ossified quality of mind as the other is an arid entity inherently existing in itself such an ossified entity as they both are is completely indifferent to everything else it is just as much a matter of indifference to a high bump whether a murderer is in close proximity as to the murderer whether flatness is near him there is of course no getting over the possibility that still remains that a bump at a certain place is connected with a certain property passion etc we can think of the murderer with a high bump here at this place on the skull the thief with one there from this point of view phrenology is capable of much greater extension than it has yet had for in the first instance it seems to be restricted merely to the connection of a bump with a property in one and the same individual in the sense that this individual possesses both but phrenology per naturam for there must be such a subject as well as physiognomy per naturam goes a long way beyond this restriction it does not merely affirm that a cunning fellow has a bump like a fist lying behind the ear but also puts forward the view that not the unfaithful wife herself but the other party to this conjugal transaction has a bump on the brow in the same way one may too imagine and conjecture the man living under the same roof with the murderer or even one's own neighbour or going still further afield conjecture one's fellow citizens etc with high bumps on some part of the skull just as well as one may picture to oneself the flying cow that was caressed by the crab riding on a donkey and afterwards etc etc but if possibility is taken not in the sense of a possibility of imagining and conjecturing and picturing but in the sense of inner possibility or possibility of conceiving then the object is a reality of the kind which is a mere thing and is and should be deprived of the significance of reality and can thus only have the sense of it for imaginative or figurative thinking the observer may in spite of the indifference of the two sides to one another set to work to determine correlations supported partly by the general rational principle that the outer is the expression of the inner and partly by the analogy of the skulls of animals which may doubtless have a simpler character than men but of which at the same time it becomes just so much the more difficult to say what character they do have and that it cannot be so easy for any man's imagination to think himself really into the nature of an animal should the observer do so he will find in giving out for certain the laws he maintains he has discovered a first-rate means of assistance in a distinction which we too must necessarily take note of at this point the being of mind cannot be taken at any rate to be something completely rigid and immovable man is free it will be admitted that the mind's original primordial being consists merely in dispositions which mind has to a large extent under its control or which require favourable circumstances to draw them out that is an original being of mind can be equally well spoken of as a being which does not as such exist at all were observations to conflict with what strikes any one as a law which he is sure of and can give out for certain should it happen to be fine weather at the annual fair or on the housewife's washing day then dealer and housewife might say that it properly speaking should rain and the conditions are really all that way so too in the case of observing the skull it might be said when those contradictory observations occur 
that the given individual ought properly to be what according to the law his skull proclaims him to be and that he has an original disposition which however has not been brought out and fulfilled this quality is not really present but it should be there the law and the ought to be rest on observation of actual showers of rain in observation of the actual sense and meaning in the case of the given specific character of the skull but if the reality is not present the empty possibility is of just as much significance this mere possibility that is the non-actuality of the law proposed and hence the observations conflicting with the law are bound to come out just for the reason that the freedom of the individual and the circumstances gradually involved are indifferent towards what merely is both in the sense of the original inner as well as the external ossiform structure and also because the individual can be something else than he is in his original internal nature and still more than what he is as a skull bone we get then the possibility that a given bump or hollow on the skull may denote both something actual as well as a mere disposition one indeed so little determined in any given direction as to denote something that is not actual at all we find the excuse made which comes of badly as a prevarication always does that it is itself there for use against what it ought to assist we see the thinking that merely means and conjectures brought by the very force of facts to say in unintelligent fashion the very opposite of what it holds to to say that there is something indicated and signified by such and such a bone but also just as truly not indicated at all what hovers before this way of conjecturing when it makes this shift is the true thought a thought however which abolishes that way of conjecturing that being as such is not at all the truth of spirit as the disposition is an original primordial being having no share in the activity of mind just such a being is the skull bone on its side what merely is without participating in spiritual activity is for consciousness a thing and so little is it the essence of mind that it is rather the very opposite of it and consciousness is only actual and concrete by the negation and abolition of such a being from this point of view it must be regarded as a thorough denial and flaunting of reason to give out the skull bone as the actual existence of conscious life and that is what it is given out to be when it is regarded as the outer form of spirit for the external shape is just the existent reality it is no use to say we merely draw an inference from the outer as to the inner which is something different or to say that the outer is not the inner itself but merely its expression for in the relation of the two to one another the character of self-reflecting and self-reflected reality falls just on the side of the inner while the outer has the character of existent reality when therefore a man is told you your inner being are so and so because your skull bone is so constituted this means nothing else than that we regard a bone as the man's reality to retort upon such a statement with a box in the ear in the way mentioned above when dealing with physiognomy brings out primarily the soft parts of his head from their apparent state and position and proves merely that these are no true inherent nature are not the reality of mind the retort here had better go the length of breaking the skull of the person who makes a statement like that in order to demonstrate to him quite as palpably as his own wisdom that a bone is nothing of an inherent nature at all for a man still less his true reality the untutored instinct of self-conscious reason will reject without examination of phrenology this other instinct of self-conscious reason is instinct for observation which having got scarcely within sight of knowledge has grasped the subject in the soulless form that the outer is an expression of the inner but the worse the thought the less sometimes does it strike us where its badness definitely lies and the more difficult is it to put one's finger on it for a thought is said to be the worse the bearer and emptier the abstraction which thought takes to be the essential truth but in the antithesis here in question the component parts are individuality conscious of itself and the abstraction of a bare thing to which externality has been reduced the inner being of mind taken in the sense of a fixed soulless existence and in opposition to that abstract being with the attainment of this however rational observation seems in fact to have also reached its culminating point at which it must take leave of itself and turn right about for it is only when anything is entirely bad that there is an inherent and immediate necessity in it to wheel round completely into its opposite just so it may be said of the jews that it is precisely because they stand directly before the door of salvation that they are and have been the most reprobate and abandoned what the nation should be in and for itself 
this the true nature of itself is not conscious of being but puts away beyond itself by this process of deprivation and renunciation it creates for itself the possibility of a higher level of existence if once it could get the object thus renounced back again to itself than if it had never left its natural immediate state of existence because spirit is all the greater the greater the opposition out of which it returns into itself and such an opposition spirit brings about for itself by doing away with its immediate unity and laying aside its self-existence the possession of a separate life of its own but if such a consciousness does not mediate and reflect itself the middle position or term where it has a determinate existence is the fatal and holy void since what should give it substance and filling has been turned into a rigidly fixed extreme it is thus that this last stage of reason's function of observation is its very worst and for that reason its complete reversal becomes necessary for the survey of the series of relations dealt with up to this point which constitute the content and object of observation shows that even in its first form in observation of the relations of inorganic nature sensuous being vanished from its ken the moments of nature's condition present themselves as pure abstractions and as bare and simple notions which should be kept connected with the existence of things but this gets lost so that the abstract moment proves to be a pure movement and a universal this free self-complete process retains the significance of something objective but now appears as a unit in the process of the inorganic the unit is the inner with no existence when the process does have existence qua unit as one and single it is an organism the unit qua self-existent or negative entity stands in antithesis to the universal throws off its control and remains independent by itself so that the notion being only realized in the condition of absolute dissociation fails to find inorganic existence its genuine expression in the sense that it is not there in the form of a universal it remains an outer or what is the same thing an inner of organic nature the organic process is merely free implicitly it is not so explicitly for itself the explicit phase of its freedom appears in the idea of purpose has its existence in the form of something else of a self-directing aim and guidance that lies outside the mere process reason's function of observation thus turns its attention to this aim and guidance to mind to the notion actually existing as universality or to the purpose existing in the form of purpose and what constitutes its own essential nature is now the object before it reason here in the activity of observation is directed first to the pure abstract form of its essential nature but since reason in its apprehension of the object thus working and moving amidst its own distinctions takes this object as something that exists observation becomes aware of laws of thought relations of one constant factor to another constant element the content of these laws being however merely moments they pass away into the single one of self-consciousness this new object taken in the same way as existent is the contingent individual self-consciousness the process of observation therefore keeps within the conjectured meaning of mind and within the contingent relation of conscious to unconscious reality mind alone in itself is the necessity of this relation observation therefore attacks it at closer quarters and compares its realization through will and action with its reality when it contemplates and is reflected into itself a reality which is itself objective this external aspect although an utterance of the individual which he himself contains is at the same time qua symbol something indifferent to the content which it is intended to denote just as what finds for itself the symbol is indifferent to this symbol for this reason observation finally passes from this variable form of utterance back to the permanent fixed being and in principle declares that externality is the outer immediate reality of mind not in the sense of an organ and not like a language or a symbol but in the sense of a lifeless thing what the very first form of observation of inorganic nature did away with and superseded that is the idea that the notion should appear in the shape of a thing this last form of observation reinstates so as to turn the reality of mind itself into a thing or expressing it the other way about so as to give lifeless being the significance of mind observation has thus reached the point of explicitly expressing what our notion of observation was at the outset that is that rational certainty means objectivity of reason that the certainty of reason seeks itself as an objective reality 
this does not indeed mean that mind which is represented by a skull is defined as a thing there shall be no materialism as it is called in this idea mind rather must be something very different from these bones of the skull but that mind is means nothing else than that it is a thing when being as such or thingness is predicated of the mind the true and genuine expression for this is therefore that mind is such an entity as the bone is hence it must be considered as supremely important that the true expression has been found for the bare statement regarding mind that it is when the statement is ever made about mind that it is has a being is a thing an individual reality we do not mean it is something we can see or knock about or take in our hands and so on but that is what we say and what the statement really amounts to is consequently conveyed in the expression that the existence of mind is a bone this result has now a twofold significance one is its true meaning in so far as the result is a completion of the outcome of the preceding movement of self-consciousness the unhappy self-consciousness renounced its self-sufficiency its independence and wrung out its distinctive self-existence into the shape of a thing by doing so it left the level of self-consciousness and reverted to the condition of mere consciousness that is to that phase of conscious life for which the object is an existent a thing but what is thing in this case is self-consciousness thing here is the unity of ego and being the category when the object before consciousness is determined thus consciousness possesses reason consciousness as well as self-consciousness is in itself properly reason in an implicit form but only that consciousness can be said to have reason whose object has the character of being the category from this however the knowledge of what is reason is still distinct the category which is the immediate unity of being and self sein und seinen must traverse both forms and the conscious attitude of observation is just where the category is set forth in the form of being in its result consciousness expresses that whose unconscious implicit certainty it is in the shape of a proposition the proposition which lies in the very notion of reason this proposition is the infinite judgment that the self is a thing a judgment that cancels and transcends itself through this result then the category gets the added characteristic of being the self-cancelling opposition the pure category which is present to consciousness in the form of being or immediacy is still an unmediated and merely given object and the attitude of consciousness is also direct has no mediation in it that infinite judgment is the moment which brings about the transition of immediacy into mediation or negativity the given present object is therefore characterized as a negative object while consciousness in its relation towards it assumes the form of self-consciousness or the category which traverses the form of being in the process of observation is now set up in the form of self-existence as now a distinctive being for its own sake consciousness no longer seeks to find itself immediately but to produce itself by its own activity consciousness itself is the purpose and end of its own action as in the process of observation it has to do merely with things the other meaning of the result is the one already considered that of unsystematic begrifflos observation this has no other way of understanding and expressing what it is about than by declaring the reality of self-consciousness to consist in the skull bone just as it appears in the form of a thing of sense still retaining its character as an object for consciousness in stating this however it has no clear consciousness as to what the statement involves and does not grasp the determinate character of the subject and predicate in the proposition and of their relation to one another still less does it grasp the proposition in the sense of a self-resolving infinite judgment and the notion rather in virtue of a deeper lying self-consciousness of mind which has the appearance here of being an innate sincerity and honesty of nature the ignominiousness of such an irrational crude thought as that of taking a bone for the reality of self-consciousness is concealed and the very senselessness of introducing all sorts of relations of cause and effect symbol organ etc which are perfectly meaningless here and of hiding away the glaring folly of the proposition behind distinctions derived from them all this puts a gloss on that thought and whitewashes its naked absurdity brain fibres and the like looked at as forms of the being of mind 
are from the first an imagined and merely hypothetical actuality not an existent reality not felt seen in short not true reality if they do exist if they are seen they are lifeless objects and then no longer pass for the being of mind but objectivity proper must take an immediate a sensuous form so that in this objectivity qua lifeless for the bone is lifeless so far as it is in the living being itself mind is definitely established as real as actual the principle involved in this idea is that reason claims to be all thinghood even thinghood of a purely objective kind it is this however in conceptu only the notion is its truth and the purer the notion itself is the more silly an idea does it become if its content does not take the shape of a notion begriff but of a mere presentation or idea vorstellung if the self-superseding judgment is not taken with the consciousness of its infinity but is taken as a stable and permanent proposition the subject and predicate of which hold good each on its own account self fixed as self thing as thing while one has to be the other all the same reason essentially the notion is immediately parted asunder into itself and its opposite an opposition which just for that reason is immediately again superseded but by presenting itself in this way as both itself and its opposite and when held fast in the entirely particular moment of this disintegration reason is apprehended in an irrational form and the purer the moments of this opposition are the more glaring is the appearance of this content which is either solely a content for consciousness or solely expressed by consciousness in a naive form the depth which mind brings out from within but carries no further than to make it a presentation vorstellung and let it remain at this level and the ignorance on the part of this consciousness as to what it really says are the same kind of connection of higher and lower which in the case of the living being nature naively expresses when it combines the organ of its highest fulfilment the organ of generation with the organ of urination the infinite judgment qua infinite would correspond to the fulfilment of life that comprehends itself while the consciousness of life that remains at the level of presentation would correspond to urination end of section eighteen section nineteen of the phenomenology of mind volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. Chapter 5b. The Realization of Rational Self-Consciousness Through Its Own Activity. Translator's Note. In this section, we have the second form in which rational experience is realized. In observation, mind is directly aware of itself as in conscious unity with its object it makes no efforts of its own to realize this unity it finds the unity by looking on so to say but it may have the same experience by creating through its own effort an object constituted and determined solely by itself here it does not find the unity of itself and its object it makes the object at one with itself by moulding the character and content of the object after its own nature as contrasted with observation which may be called the operation of theoretical reason this new way of having a rational experience may be called the operation of practical reason in the first we have reason in the form of rational knowledge and science in the second reason is the sense of rational action and practice it is this second way of establishing the experience of reason which is analyzed in the following sections the immediately succeeding section describes the experience in its general features we have here the sphere of conscious purpose and the foundation of moral and social life end of translator's note the realization of rational self-consciousness through its own activity self-consciousness found the thing in the form of itself and itself in the form of a thing that is to say self-consciousness is explicitly aware of being in itself the objective reality it is no longer the immediate certainty of being all reality it is rather that certainty for which the immediate in general assumes the form of something sublated so that the objectivity of the immediate is regarded now as merely something superficial 
whose inner core and essence is self-consciousness the object therefore to which self-consciousness is positively related is the self-consciousness the object has the form and character of a thing that is is independent but self-consciousness has the conviction that this independent object is not alien to itself it knows straightway that itself is inherently and essentially recognized by the object self-consciousness is mind which has the assurance of having in the duplication of its self-consciousness and in the independence of both its own unity with its own self this certainty has to be brought out now in all its truth what self-consciousness holds as a fact that is that implicitly in itself and in its inner certainty it is has to enter into full consciousness and become explicit for it what the general stages of this actualization will be can be indicated in a general way by reference to the road thus far traversed just as reason when exercised in observation repeated in the medium of categories the movement of consciousness as such namely sense certainty perception and understanding the course of reason here too will again traverse the double movement of self-consciousness and from independence pass over into its freedom to begin with this active reason is aware of itself merely as an individual and must being such demand and bring forth its reality in an other thereupon however its consciousness being lifted into universality it becomes universal reason and is consciously aware of itself as reason as something already recognized in and for itself which within its mere consciousness unites all self-consciousness it is again the simple ultimate spiritual reality wesen, which by coming at the same time to consciousness is the real substance into which the preceding forms return and in which they find their ground so that they are with reference to the latter merely particular moments of its process of coming into being moments which indeed break loose and appear as forms on their own account but have in fact only existence and actuality when born and supported by it and only retain their truth in so far as they are and remain in it if we take this final result of the process as it is when really accomplished this end which is the notion that has just come before us that is recognized self-consciousness which has the certainty of itself in the other free self-consciousness and finds its truth precisely there in other words if we bring this merely inward and unevolved mind to light as a substance that has developed into its concrete existence we shall find that in this notion there is opened up before us the realm of the social order the ethical world Sittlichkeit. for this latter is nothing else than the absolute spiritual unity of the essential substance wesen, of individuals in their independent realization of themselves as individuals it is an inherently universal self-consciousness which is aware of being so concrete and real in another consciousness that this latter has complete independence is looked on as a thing and the universal self-consciousness is aware precisely therein of its unity with that thing and is only then self-consciousness when thus in unity with this objective being wesen. this ethical substance when taken in its abstract universality is only the conception of law thought constituted law but even so it is immediately actual self-consciousness it is custom Sitte. the single individual conversely is only a this a given existent unit since he is aware of the universal consciousness as his own being in his own particular individuality seeing that his action and existence are the universal custom in point of fact the notion of the realization of self-conscious reason of having a sense of complete unity with another in its independence of having for my object another in the form of a thing found detached and apart from me and the negative of myself and of taking this as my self-existence für mich sein finds its actual fulfilment in the life of a nation reason appears here as the fluent universal substance as unchangeable simple thingness which at the same time breaks up into many entirely independent beings just as light bursts asunder into stars as innumerable luminous points each giving light on its own account and whose absolute self-existence für sich sein is dissolved not merely implicitly an sich but explicitly for themselves für sich within the simple independent substance 
they are conscious within themselves of being these individual independent beings through the fact that they surrender and sacrifice their particular individuality and that this universal substance is their soul and essence as this universal again is the action of themselves as individuals and is the work and product of their own activity the purely particular activity and business of the individual refer to needs and wants which he has as a part of nature that is as a mere existent particular that even these its commonest functions do not come to nothing but have reality is brought about by the universal sustaining medium the might of the entire nation it is not merely however this form of subsistence for his activity in general that the individual gets in the universal substance but likewise also his content what he does is what we are all capable of doing is the custom all follow this content in so far as it is completely particularized is in its concrete reality not confined to the single individual but involves and embraces the activity of all the labor of the individual for his own wants and necessities is just as much a satisfaction of those of others as of himself and the satisfaction of his own he attains only by the labor of others as the individual in his own particular work ipso facto accomplishes unconsciously a universal work so again he also performs the universal task as his conscious object the whole becomes in its entirety his work for which he sacrifices himself and precisely by that means receives back his own self from it there is nothing here which could not be reciprocal nothing in regard to which the independence of the individual might not in dissipating its existence on its own account Fülsichsein, in negating itself give itself its positive significance of existing for itself this unity of existing for another or making self a thing and of existence for self this universal substance utters its universal language in the customs and laws of a nation but this existent unchangeable nature wesen is nothing else than the expression of the particular individuality which seems opposed to it the laws give expression to that which each individual is and does the individual knows them not merely to be what constitutes his universal objective nature as a thing but knows himself too in that form or knows it to be particularized in his own individuality and in each of his fellow citizens in the universal mind therefore each is certain of himself only because he finds in the actual reality nothing but himself he is as certain of the others as of himself i apprehend and see in all of them that they are in their own eyes für sich selbst, only these independent beings just as i am i see in their case the free unity with others in such wise that just as this unity exists through me so it exists through the others too i see them as myself myself as them in a free nation therefore reason is in truth realized it is a present living mind where the individual not only finds his determinate nature that is his universal and particular being expressed and given to him in the form of a thing but himself is this real being and has also attained his constitutive character and position the wisest men of antiquity for that reason declared that wisdom and virtue consist in living in accordance with the customs of one's own nation from this happy state however of having attained its determinate nature and of living in it the self-consciousness which in the first instance is only immediately and in principle mind has broken away or perhaps it has not yet attained it for both can be said with equal truth reason must pass out of and leave this happy condition for only implicitly or immediately is the life of a free nation real objective ethical order Siedlichkeit. In other words, the latter is a merely existent social order, and in consequence this universal mind is also something particular. The totality of customs and laws is a specifically determinate ethical substance, which casts off this restricted limitation only when it reaches the higher moment, namely, when it becomes conscious regarding its own nature. Only with this knowledge does it get its absolute truth, and not as it is immediately in its bare existence in this latter form it is partly restricted and circumscribed partly the absolute limitation consists just in this that mind is there in the form of existence 
hence further the individual as he immediately finds his existence in the actual objective social order in the life of his nation has a solid imperturbable confidence the universal mind has not here resolved itself into its abstract moments and thus too he does not think of himself as existing in singleness and independence when however he has once arrived at this knowledge as indeed he must this immediate unity with mind this undifferentiated existence in the substance of mind his sense of naive confidence is lost isolated by himself he is himself now the central essential reality no longer universal mind the element of the singleness of self-consciousness is no doubt in universal mind itself but merely as a vanishing quantity which as it appears with an existence of its own is straightway resolved within the universal and only becomes consciously felt in the form of that sense of confidence when the individual gets fixity in the form of singleness and every moment being a moment of the essential reality must manage to reveal itself as essential the individual has thereby set himself in opposition to the laws and customs these latter are looked on as merely a thought without absolutely essential significance an abstract theory without reality while he qua this particular ego is in his own view the living truth or again we can say as above stated that self-consciousness has not yet attained this happy state of being ethical substance the mind of a nation for after leaving the process of rational observation mind at first is not yet as such actually realized through itself it is merely affirmed as inner nature and essence or as abstraction in other words mind is first immediate as immediate existing however it is particular it is practical consciousness which steps into the world it finds lying ready-made with the intention of duplicating itself in the determinate form of an individual of producing itself as this particular individual and creating this its own existential counterpart and thus becoming conscious of this unity of its own actual reality with the objective world self-consciousness possesses the certainty of this unity it holds that the unity is implicitly an sich already present or that this union and agreement between itself and thinghood objective existence is already a fait accompli and has only to become expressly so through its own agency or that its making that unity is at the same time and as much its finding the unity since this unity means happiness the individual is thus sent forth into the world by his own spirit to seek his happiness if then we for our part find the truth of this rational self-consciousness to be ethical substance that self-consciousness on its part finds here the beginning of its moral experience of the world looking at it as not having yet had such experience this process drives it in that direction and what is cancelled in the process are the particular moments which self-consciousness takes as valid in isolation they have the form of an immediate will process or impulse of nature which attains its satisfaction the satisfaction itself being the content of a new impulse looking at self-consciousness however as having lost the happiness of being up in the substance these natural impulses are bound up with a consciousness that their purpose is the true vocation and essential nature of self-consciousness ethical substance has sunk to the level of a floating selfless adjective whose living subjects are individuals which have to fill up their universality through themselves and to provide for their vocation out of the same source taken in the former sense then those forms and modes are the process by which the ethical substance comes to be and precede the substance in the latter they succeeded and disclose for self-consciousness what its vocation is in the former aspect the immediacy or raw brute impulses get lost in the process of finding out what their truth is and their content passes over to a higher in the latter aspect however the false idea of consciousness which puts its vocation in that immediacy passes to a higher idea in the former case the goal which they attain is the immediate ethical substance while in the latter the end is the consciousness of that substance such a consciousness as knows the substance to be its own essential being and to that extent this process would be the development of morality moralität a higher state of attitude than the former 
but these modes at the same time constitute only one side of the development of morality that namely which belongs to self-existence or in which consciousness cancels its purposes they do not constitute the side where morality arises out of the substance itself since these moments cannot yet have the signification of being made into purposes in opposition to the lost social order Sittlichkeit, they hold here no doubt in their simple uncriticised content and the end towards which they work is the ethical substance but since with our time is more directly associated that form of these moments in which they appear after consciousness has lost its ethical custom constituted Sittliches, life and in the search for it repeats those forms they may be represented more after this latter manner of expression self-consciousness which is merely at first the notion of mind takes this path with the specific characteristic of being to itself the essential reality qua individual mind and its purpose therefore is to give itself actualization as individual and to enjoy itself qua individual in so doing in existing for itself it is aware of itself as the essentially real in this character it is the negativity of the other there arises therefore within its consciousness an opposition between itself qua positive and something which no doubt exists but for it not in the sense of existing substantially consciousness appears sundered into this objective reality found lying at its hand and the purpose which it carries out by the process of cancelling that objectivity and which it makes the actual fact instead of the given object its primary purpose however is its immediate abstract existence for itself its seeing itself as this particular individual in another or in looking upon another self-consciousness as itself the experience of what the truth of this purpose is places self-consciousness on a higher plane and henceforth it is to its self-purpose in so far as it is at once universal and has the law immediately within it in carrying out this law of its heart however it learns that here the individual cannot preserve himself but rather the good can only be performed through the sacrifice of the individual and so it passes into virtue the experience which virtue goes through can be no other than that of finding that its purpose is already implicitly an sich, carried out that happiness lies immediately in action itself and action is just the good the principle and notion of this entire sphere of existence that is that thinghood is the independent self-existence of mind becomes in the course of this experience an objective fact for self-consciousness when self-consciousness has found this principle it is aware of itself as reality in the sense of directly self-expressing individuality which no longer finds any resistance in a reality opposed to it and whose object and purpose are merely this function of self-expression end of section nineteen